Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together to study your word. It is a, a privilege to be able to do so. And we uh, ask that you bless our learning, our discussion, and our deliberation this morning as we look at, continue to look at the Ten Commandments, and today especially looking at the Fifth Commandment and what it means for our lives as your followers. All these things, Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So if you want to open up your catechisms to page 85, page 85, that's where the fifth commandment is. And uh, just a little catechism quiz here. What is the fifth commandment? Thou shalt got verbatim? What? Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not murder, right? Thou shalt not murder. They used to say thou shalt not kill. Okay. That's a good one to start with. Why is there a difference between kill and murder? Yes, there is, right? We got we got a few legal minds in here. Isn't thou shalt not kill the closer translation? Hmm? Isn't thou shalt not kill the closer translation? I'd have to look that up because I was not uh, I did not have that as part of my prepared stuff um, but well so we can talk about that when we get to the interpretation is closer to murder as far as the way we've interpreted the commandments uh, given by the way some of our church fathers have written about it and the way it's usually understood but as far as the the Hebrew there I'll have to look that up my guess would be because Hebrew does not have as many vocabulary words mm -hmm. as Greek or English does, my guess would be that the the word could be interpreted either way. Okay, but I'll have, I'd have to look that up for sure. So somebody said there is a difference between killing and murder. What's the difference? Malice. Malice, right? Malice is a form of intent, right? So uh, you uh, either murder somebody on purpose. Or you're treating them like violently enough to where you should have known that it could lead to that, right? So what's an example of someone killing that wouldn't be murder? Using the things God commanded to give the right to you. Like they were to stone somebody or something. Okay, so there were there are laws in the Old Testament about stoning people if they, they sinned against God in particular ways. Right. What would that be an example of? By what? By which authority are they carrying out that task? They're God's authority, and who is who is He using primarily to exercise that authority? In other words, what would be the modern day equivalent? The justice system, right? Capital punishment in the justice system. Would you say that the person who flips the switch on the electric chair or that's the actual injecting or sets it up or however far back you want to trace the cause. Are they murderers? No, right? Now, some people think they are because they don't make this distinguishing that we're making, right? They don't, they don't distinguish between kill and murder. And so they would say that capital punishment is murder. From the biblical perspective, it's not, right? Um, there's a verse that talks about how God did not give the earthly authorities the sword in vain, okay? Um, now, it doesn't mandate that it has to be that way, but it also absolves those who are part of that as part of the government from being called a murderer. Does that make sense? Hey, Pastor? Yeah. Uh, I actually uh, have an answer for Rob on the Hebrew with that. Um, the Hebrew, there are two words for killing in, in Hebrew. One is harag, and the other is ratza. Harag is general killing, and ratza is intentional murder. Uh, it's the word ratza that was used in the commandment. There you go. There we go. So there's two different words in Hebrew for killing. One denotes intent, and the other one is just a general reference to someone getting killed by somebody else. And the one that refers to intent is the, the word that's used in the commandment. Okay. Um, what's another, so we talked about the government has, has been given the authority by God to carry out something like capital punishment and not be considered, and not be considered murder or a violation of the fifth commandment. 
What's the other example? Military. Military, right? Um, Martin Luther has a uh, has written on this before. I can bring that in if you'd like, where he talks about um, why soldiers are not considered murderers. Um, he does, you, you could be a murderer and also be a soldier, right? So that doesn't exempt you. So if you're a soldier, it doesn't just mean you can go around killing whoever you want. But if you are killing as a soldier in the like vocational calling of a soldier in a, in a battle, for example, that's not a violation of as we understand it. Because yeah. uh, it wasn't like the guy that the soldier shot, he personally knew and he hated his guts and he wanted him to die. Right? And most people who have come back from war, they don't like any of that stuff. It's not that they wanted to do it. And you can tell by the way it affects them. Human beings aren't meant to do that to one another. Right? Ron, you had your hand up? No. Yeah, what? No, Ron. Uh, what the, 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 in the Old Testament, when God got pretty upset with some folks, and he would say, surely you will die if you come over by the pantry or something like that. Uh -huh. uh, how would you classify that? So the, the question was that uh, there are times in the Old Testament where God basically, he's upset with somebody and says, if you do this, surely you will die. Right. So probably the best example are the priests that were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Right? And they're marching around the city of Jericho, and one of them slips and falls, and somebody else just out of the good and kind goodness and kindness of their heart reaches out to try to catch it, and they die because they're not supposed to touch it. Right? Um, anything that's a direct decree from God is that that's basically what it is, right? So because he's the one setting these laws, right? So when he makes a direct decree, it is a law. You know, it, it would be a law of the same equivalency as the Ten Commandments. Because um, the Ten Commandments was just like a formal declaration from God about if you do this, then this will happen, or if you don't do this, then this will happen. But that's a good question. Right? A lot of people struggle with the Old Testament God for that reason. Right? He seems angry, vengeful. Um, he seems like he condones the murder of lots of people. Right, um, like when he has Joshua invade Canaan, what is, does anybody know what instructions he gives to them when they conquer certain cities? Kill them all. Yeah. Kill everyone. Not, not just the other soldiers, but also the women and the children as well. And so people are sort of like, you know, how can a God of love be that way? Well, how do we answer that question? God's purpose there. Was that these were his chosen people that had to be kept separate so that Christ could be there. And if they got infected with all this other stuff that happened, then God's okay. plan could not be sort of. So that's sort of like a reference to the old like God is keeping his covenants with the Israelites, right? With the specific chosen people of God. But God has in mind from the very beginning to send Jesus. And so that salvation has always been intended not just for like the ethnic Israelites, but no, for they all those who believe. They're not pure, but they had to. If they had stopped following him totally, he would never. Sure. He wouldn't have, he had to come from yeah, Canaan. and he does give them a command to not intermarry with the Canaanites for that reason, yeah. right? That um, you, if you intermarry with the Canaanites because they have a different faith, within a few generations you will no longer remember me, oh. right? And that is what happens, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty crazy. Like in Joshua chapter two, it tells us that within two generations of Moses, so like Moses' grandchildren, because they did not listen to God. Like, none of them essentially knew what God did for them in Egypt. But that doesn't really answer the question as to why, why it's not an evil that God commands them to kill the men, women, and children in the places they conquer. Master? Mm. Yeah. I would say he's God. <laughs> All right, he's God. He, he can do 
anything. Yeah, so that's a big part of the answer, right? He's God. So part of being God means like you do whatever you want um, in a certain sense, right? Now we would like to say, well, we know a little bit about God's character, so he wouldn't choose to do certain things, right? Which to a point is true, but you want to be careful when you start assuming things based on your perception of God's character, especially if it's in, in territory where like he hasn't revealed specifics to us, right? Luther calls that the hidden God. So we don't want to get too far down a, a road of conclusions based off something that may or may not be true about God or that we may be sort of right about, but not totally right about. Yeah, Russ, yes. We deserve that. <clears throat> So Russ made the, the answer, we deserve that fate as well, right? So we talked about this a little bit, I don't know, maybe three classes or four classes ago with the doctrine of original sin, right? Um, just because it's a mercy that God saves us does not mean that it's a sin if he destroys us. Let me say it again. Just because it's a mercy that God saves us does not mean that it is an evil that he destroys us. Okay? Because God is love. This is true. What is God also? Justice. He's just. Right? And so Jesus is the perfect answer to both of those things. If God wasn't just, then Jesus would not have had to die. Because there wouldn't have had to been a very real penalty for the sins of the world. But there did have to be a real penalty for the sins of the world. Because God is just. And his wrath against the world was justified. Okay? Um, now, just as in the same way that I can't go off too far into the woods with regards to if God is loved, then this means this means this means this, if it's not written in the scriptures. It's in the same sense that I can't also claim to know exactly why, apart from the fact that all of us are sinners and enemies of God, and he is justified in destroying us. I cannot answer specifically why the Canaanites or why the citizens of Jericho, other than they were opposing the chosen people of God, right? Because Along with original sin, it doesn't mean that some people are deserving of destruction. It means everyone is, right? You and me included. And that is the, one of the difficulties of faith is, like, we believe that we did not choose God, right? It's not, I decided that I really thought Christianity made sense, so I decided to give my heart to Jesus. We read this book in the seminary called The uh, Hammer of God really good book if you want to check it out it's a novel so it's not some like really dense theological tome but one of the things in there is that a guy is saying that a young pastor is saying you know when did you give your heart to jesus and an older pastor says why would i give him that that's a horrible gift because my heart is full of all kinds of vileness and evil why would i give that to jesus and he gives this image of, he said, it's more like Jesus is walking home and he's got a walking stick and he sees a rusted can on a junk heap and decides to pick it up with his walking stick and take it home with him. Right? That, that our lives and our hearts are unworthy gifts. So it, not only that, but the scripture tells us that we're dead in our sins. Right? Dead people can't do anything. They can't be like, oh, Jesus, here. I've decided that you make sense and I'm going to follow after you. Right? It is. Um, it even, he even says that Jesus even says it himself in the New Testament. He says, you did not choose me. I chose you. Right? Now, as to why he did that and not others, that's been a question since the beginning. I have no idea. Right? I just know what I'm supposed to do in order to bring the Holy Spirit to others, share the word of God and the, and the gifts and the means of grace. So that's what we do as the church. Right? All right. Good question to start us off. All right, we haven't even started on the official outline. <laughs> I'm sensing a pattern here in Ascension oh, yeah. that it's going to take me longer to get through things than I think it's going to take. That's okay. I don't mind that.
All right, so um, what does this mean to you shall not murder? So I'm going to read that for us. Got it written on your hand out there. I'll read it. We, we, should, we should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. All right, thank you. So we talked about how every commandment that has a negative and a positive. So what's the negative and the positive of the fifth commandment? There's a thing you should not do and then a thing you ought to do. So what's the thing you should not do? We should not hurt or harm. Hurt or harm. Okay. Is that different than you shall not murder? Yes. Yeah. Why does it why is Luther write that in his meaning then? Even negative thoughts about somebody are going against thou shall not murder okay so in my I like to be honest in my bible study promo video that i was going to post to our facebook page i almost titled it am i a murderer question mark and sorry that probably wouldn't be that great to post on our social media page but that's that's really the the question right is um at face value this seems like ah, dude this commandment easy peasy no problem all i gotta do is not kill people that's easy Right? Unless I'm a sociopath, I have no problem doing that. But then Jesus comes along and torpedoes that idea. And we'll get to that in a moment. But what Luther's getting at here is that it's not just the, the actual taking of their life, but the desiring of hurt or harm for them that is a violation of this command. Because then, in your heart, they're no longer worth, they're no longer like fully human to you. Right. <laughs> Killing me softly with this song. Very nice, Mark. Um, <clears throat> All right. So that's the that's the uh, prohibition. That's what we ought not to do. What are what should we do? Yeah. Right. In other words, you're not keeping this commandment just by not killing people. Or, or not harming them. The way that we abide by this commandment is also by desiring the good and the well-being of others, right? Help and support him in every physical need. And this one is specifically about their physical needs, right? Not their emotional needs. Not, well, we, those get covered by the other things. Okay. Hey, Pastor? Yes, Pete. Uh, I passed by a uh, church sign this past week that fits really, really aptly into this conversation. And the sign said, you will not me meet a person that God does not love. And that, that, that really, I think, speaks to the heart uh, of this commandment. If God loves people, who are we to hate them? Right. And it actually has a great point, and I think it even it even goes deeper than that. So one of the things you study in philosophy is a bunch of different worldviews about about life, um, and one of the, and some of those don't agree with the basic principle that human life has intrinsic value over and above other life on Earth, right? So you and I may think somebody is, uh, who is a follower of PETA sounds like a crazy person because they're more angry about a death of a lion in Africa. Than about a bunch of human babies that are being killed through abortive means three blocks away. Why do you think that that is that that's something that they do? They're crazy. <laughs> we, well, we would say they're crazy, right? But there's a reason behind that. So if you're if you're a believer in naturalism, that means that all life is the same. So the death of a dog is the same as the death of a human. And really, a lot of the horrible atrocities in human history started fostering those sorts of ideas, right? Or at the very least, the idea that I can subjectively determine the value of life for another person or another group of people. The Bible automatically does not allow that because it talks about every human being has an intrinsic dignity given to them by God. That they were breathed. The breath of life was breathed into them by God. 
and then he gave them a specific place in creation over and above other things, right? It's the only, what's the only thing in the Genesis account that's attributed to human beings? That's not attributed to anything else in all of creation. Image of God. That human beings are specifically called out as being made in the image of God, which means every human being, regardless of how well you like them or not, has intrinsic value because they're a reflection of the creator. Now, you and I just assume that because it's a really basic assumption of our faith and our whole way of looking at the universe. But there are people who don't agree with that. And it's not, it's, it's common now because of the effect of, of Judeo-Christianity on, on the development of society. But prior to this, it was not. And there are still many places in the world where it is not. So we ought not take that for granted. And the fifth commandment is related to that, as Pete pointed out. Right? Every human being is loved by God and has that intrinsic value. This really hit me when I was reading a book, The Tale of Two Cities, and I won't ruin it for people who haven't read it. But there's a character in that book that I hated, and you're supposed to hate. Okay, and then at the end of the book, there's this scene of noble sacrifice. And for whatever reason, after I read that book, it, it hit me that like as noble as that sacrifice was, it was for one whom the person who committed the sacrifice loved. And for whatever reason in my mind, it immediately jumped to, but Jesus died for the person that I hated. And it just sort of overwhelmed me for a little while. Like, like, have you ever read a book or watched a TV series, and the only reason you're interested in a character is because you want them to get what they deserve? <laughs> right? And they're, just, and they're written that way. They're written to be like deplorably despicable characters. Those are people that Christ died for. Like, that's an insane, it's an amazing thought when I really think about it. It's also an insane one. Right? And that's sort of what Paul was getting at in our Romans reading today at church. Is that even for a good person, one might dare die, although not very much. But God showed his love that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Like that's that's the cool part. The opposite is also in the gospel. Somewhere God Jesus says, you know, even the sinners and murderers love their families. Right. Yeah. That uh, it's really inconvenient to learn human, like positive human characteristics about people you don't like. And so we spend a lot of time preventing ourselves from learning those things. Like, well, they're just that crazy person over there that said this crazy thing. I don't really want to know that they've got a husband they love and children they love and all that stuff, because then it's a lot more difficult for me to dislike them, at least on that sort of level. So <clears throat> we got to watch out for that. Okay, um, open up your Bibles, Luke chapter 10. Because in our meaning that Luther wrote for us, there's a word that he uses in there that starts with an end called neighbor. And since he uses the word neighbor, we should probably try and figure out who exactly constitutes my neighbor. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25. You probably know the story. The parable of the Good Samaritan. All right, and there's a lot of verses, so I'm just going to read it, and I want you to follow along. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? <laughs> Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. 
Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will pay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. So, who is our neighbor? Everyone. Everyone is. Very good. Some of you were looking at the uh, catechism, maybe. Everyone, right? Now, if everyone's my neighbor, am I always violating my neighborly duties by not helping everyone? No, it's impossible to help everybody. It's impossible to help everybody, but but I'm supposed to, right? I'm supposed to desire their good and, and, and help them, and everybody's my neighbor. Yeah, that's the part of this commandment that says, love your neighbor. Okay, so part of the, the commandment is it mirrors our sin back to us when we fail to do that. But is it always a sin if I'm not helping everyone? It's also stated that we shall have our own house in order before we set somebody else's house in order. Okay, so there's an element of having to be able to take care of yourself on your own. But what about, um, let's give a concrete example. Is it sinful for you not to help a starving child in Uganda? It depends on your reason why you fail to do something. You cannot be feeding a person who's thousands of miles away. Okay. So there's an element of impossibility there, right? You don't even know their name, where they live. You just know the country. It's impossible for you to feed them. But what if somebody comes and asks you, hey, I've got this, this organization, and this organization is on the ground in Uganda, and we do orphan care and the feeding of the poor. Would you care to donate? Step one is to get out your phone and see what percent of the money that organization gets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, that's true. You want to be part of being a good steward is making sure that people aren't trying to swindle you, right? So you got to check them out. We have to go with what resources God has given to us. Yes. We're not giving like above above and beyond our not above the tide we're just sharing our resources but there's a lot of people having the same problems and different things and we can't possibly if I gave to everything that everybody asked me for I wouldn't be able to pay my bills and right. I right. my you mean you're not an infinite source of money? <laughs> no, <I'm> not. <laughs> no me neither right <laughs> So the, the point I'm making here is, because um, all these points are valid, right? That, that if I'm helping everyone who approaches me about a just cause, I'm not gonna have money to pay my own bills, right? Because there's a lot of just causes out there because there's a lot of sin in the world. And there are a lot of people who are trying to work against that, right? Bob. Yeah, personally, you have, if, you're, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, that's who you have to um, glorify. And if he tells you to do it, to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and he's not going to have a guilt on you, so you'll know. All right, so Bob makes the point that, that you've been given the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit helps guide you in these decisions, and so he will help guide you to knowing whether or not you should do something. Um, then there's also people like Sorry. then there's also people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who, as he's being taken away, he looks at his gold wedding ring and go, I could have sold that and helped. Sure, sure. And I, I would say that in, like, you, you want to do everything in, in this realm of thinking in good conscience and prayerful, in, in prayerful consideration, right? Uh, because 
Like, what's going to happen to your own mind as you try to contemplate all of the ways that you could help and all the missed opportunities and all this? It's going to quickly overwhelm you. Right? One, because you're not equipped or capable of doing the thing that you're thinking you ought to do. Yeah. So, I mean, I, it is easy for us to sort of get bogged down in that for a minute and how books, how broad we should interpret it because we know about suffering and we do have more meanings than at any given time in human history. But I think what the parable really brings to us is it's a person that was literally put in, in, the, in the path, right? So you know, God doesn't make mistakes with those kinds of things. And in a sense, um, you know, it, it's clear that the others who were crossing the street were, were trying to, to basically take that out of their path. And so, you know, as, as the Good Samaritan was, you know, was, was just going about his daily life, God put someone that he was uniquely called to serve. So look for the same sort of weird thing. Okay, so Russ, Russ made the point that if we look at the parable, in the parable, the person that, that ends up he ends up serving as his neighbor is someone who's quite literally placed in his path. Um, if this parable does not speak to any sort of guilt that the Samaritan incurs because there's another path of another beat up person that he's not addressing, right? Um, that doesn't mean that that person doesn't deserve help. But we also have to trust that we're not the only ones helping. Right? That's one of the one of the blessings of the church, not only our own congregation, but also the church in our country and in the world, is that there are people that God is putting in place. And, and the question that I have to ask is not, is this person worthy of help? Because for a Christian, that question is always answered with yes. The question is, am I the one being sent to help this person? Right? And the reason I wanted to make that distinction is it just grinds my gears to no end when somebody tries to make you feel guilty about not helping in an area that you haven't been called to help. In. Okay? Um, that's a guilt that they're putting on you that God is not. And some people really, really struggle with that right? when somebody says that to them. So if you've prayerfully considered and you're a good steward of your money, and somebody comes up and asks you, would you donate to our worthy cause, and you don't have the money left over to do that because you've donated to other things, and then they try to make you feel guilty about that, ignore them. That's not a guilt coming from God or from them. Now, if there is, as the parable puts forth, someone is placed directly in your path that you try to ignore against the whisperings of your conscience, that's a different question entirely. And then the guilt is often coming from God. Right? Um, now, that doesn't mean that, uh, like, somebody who's half dead and beaten up on the side of the road is a different thing than somebody who's necessarily begging for food. Okay? Um, so there is, there is always that element of wisdom when you go through that, because there are people who try to scam you and swindle you, right? So you want to, like my policy with some of that stuff is, if somebody's asking for money for food, I'm going to give them food, right? And I've had instances where I've offered that, and they said, no, thanks, I actually just need money for rent, okay? Um, but there are also cases where they genuinely need that, and they're very grateful. Um, and so, you know, just by asking that, taking that extra step, you're able to distinguish that. So that was, that was one point I wanted to make about who is your neighbor. Because the objective answer is easy, everyone. But the practical calling we have as Christians is a little bit more difficult. So I don't want you to ascribe yourself guilt that doesn't belong to you. Because we're all going to incur enough of godly guilt trying to do this. We don't need any extra. <clears throat> all right. Any other questions regarding who is our neighbor? All right, letter B. How do we fear and love God in keeping the fifth commandment? All right, so uh, let's see. Rob, can you look up Psalm chapter 10, verse 8? Uh, let's see. Uh, Ron, can you look up the Ephesians 4, 31 to 32? Uh, let's see. Somebody online. Mark, can you look up the Matthew 25, 42 to 43? 
Um, let's see. Lisa, you want to look up Matthew 5, verse 22? And we'll go with those first. All right, Psalm 10, verse 8. He lies in wait near the villages. From ambush, he murders the innocent, watching in secret for his victims. All right, so what's the violation of the fifth commandment in that verse? This is the easy one. Huh? It's pretty obvious. I mean, he's murdered. Murder, right? Yeah. So that's a violation. Um, so we keep God, we, how do we fear and love God and keep the fifth commandment? Well, we don't do that, right? We don't murder. All right, Ephesians 4, 31 to 32, huh? Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, following and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. All right, so Ephesians 4 is not is, is focusing on something other than the act of killing. It is the saying or thinking of things that desire the injure or endanger the life of others. All right, so uh, a clear example of that would be is if uh, you know somebody's innocent with regard to some sort of crime and you lie about it so that they then face the penalty of that, that would be a violation of the fifth man. All right, uh, Matthew 25, Mark. All right, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. All right, so uh, how do we fear and love God and keep the fifth commandment? What's it talking about there? Well, yeah, what do we call that? If somebody incurs like physical harm as a result of what Mark just read, what is that called? Neglect. Neglect. That's what I was going to say. Neglect. Right. So we're guilty of violating the fifth commandment if we neglect to assist people in bodily need. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Matthew 5, Lisa. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Okay, so what is that one talking about? Talking. We started with actual murder. What's this talking about? Anger or hatred in your heart. Huh? I think gossip. Well, gossip's a broader category. It should be gossip. But this is, Jesus is making the point, this is in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is making the point here. So you think you're keeping the fifth commandment because you haven't killed anyone. Truly I say to you that if you had hatred or anger in your heart against your brother, you're guilty of this commandment. Okay? Um, so this one is harboring anger or hatred in our hearts against our neighbors. <clears throat> All right. Next set of verses, Russ, can you look up Romans 12 to 20? Um, Allie, can you look up Proverbs 31, 8 and 9? Uh, Laura, can you look up Colossians 3, 12 to 14? So we covered all of the negatives, right? All the things that we ought not to do. And here we're going to start looking at some of the things that we are supposed to do. Romans 12, 20. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If thirsty, give him drink. If he's aging, keep cool and fire on him. Okay. So, this, I wanted to, I liked this verse for this because it brings up an important point. Can you read the uh, first part again? If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your what? Enemy. Your enemy. Okay. Is your enemy your neighbor? Yes. Yes. Yes, they are. It's one of the radical teachings of Jesus, right? That uh, you should desire good and bless those who persecute you. Right? If you've seen any amazing story of Christian forgiveness and love, there's always that element in there, which is just amazing. Which is that somebody who's done horrible and awful and cruel things to someone else, 
then their active desire is to forgive that person and that they are well is a very is only in something that a Christian does. Right? So the one that's coming to my mind is the story Unbroken. You've seen that movie. Whereas a American prisoner of war and uh, he's imprisoned by the Japanese. And there was a big deal about him trying to forgive this Japanese officer who subjected him to unbelievable levels of torment and persecution. And unfortunately, in that case, I believe the officer refused to meet with him. You know, um, probably out of guilt. Because uh, it's a scary thing to face somebody who you've, you've just abused who wants to forgive you and love you. Um, so there was also recently a clip from one of the court proceedings. It was, I think it was about the white female officer who broke into the wrong apartment and ended up uh, shooting somebody, uh, shooting a black man who was in his own apartment, but she she had been called for a, some, some domestic issue or a break-in and she got the wrong place. And in the trial, her, the, the guy who shot his younger brother forgives her and wishes her well and expressly says to her, like I think in the video, he actually asked her if he can give her a hug. You know, those are powerful things that are rooted in, in this idea. Right. That, that everyone is worthy of love because of God and that I'm I, there's no way I have any ground to stand on to withhold it. Right. So even in those situations. So your enemy is also your neighbor. Okay, Proverbs 31. Allie? <clears throat> Open your mouth to the mute for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth Judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. All right. So, opening your mouth to speak in defense of those who cannot speak for themselves or those in, in great need. Right? So, speaking in a way that helps and defends our neighbor. This is Proverbs 31 there. And then, lastly, uh, Colossians 3. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Thank you. I love that one. Colossians 3, 12, and 14. Treat our neighbor with kindness and compassion. Right? Loving them as God loves us, forgiving them because we are forgiven by God. I love how the scriptures draws that back to the why. Why should I forgive and love this person? I don't have any reason to. Yes, you do. Because God forgave and loved you. And that's hard. That is hard. I, I, that was the, the, this realization was what I, where I finally understood why there's a part in, in the liturgy that says, because you have forgiveness, therefore you are feared. And for a long time, I was like, what's scary about forgiveness? That's scary about forgiveness. It means that I'm to forgive even the person I really don't want to. Even if they've done me extreme harm, I'm called to forgive them. Why? Not because they're great or deserving, but because Christ forgave me. And I was not worthy or deserving. Right. All right, now let's turn to page 88 and 89 in your catechism, looking at question 62. How does this commandment apply to some specific issues today? Okay. So let's look at Jeremiah 1, verse 5. Trisha, you want to look that up for us? Jeremiah 1, verse 5. Um, let's see. Cheryl, can you look up Psalm 139, verse 16? Oh, wait, I put these on. These are the ones that are in the uh, catechism on that page. If you're on that page, they're in there for you. 
Go ahead whenever you're ready, Trish. Okay. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. All right, so that's Jeremiah 1, 5, and then Psalm 139. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. All right, so what do you think those passages are referring to when it comes to the Fifth Commandment and a particular issue of today? Unborn children and abortion, right. So... This commandment applies by forbidding aborting the life of an unborn child. That is a violation of God's law. Now, Jeremiah 1 5 is specifically referring to Jeremiah, but if God knows you before you're formed in the womb, that doesn't, he's not just talking about Jeremiah in that particular case. This the specificity of Jeremiah is applied to I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Right. <clears throat> And then the Psalm 139 passage talks about how God knows you before your substance is formed. Right. So for a Christian, abortion is a sin. All right, the second one, B, letter B, halfway down page 89. It forbids killing oneself, suicide, uh, seeking help in killing oneself assisting a person in taking his or her own life, or killing a person who asks to die or whose life is deemed as too burdensome. All right, so those are um, referred to suicide, assisted suicide, and then euthanasia, right? And those are all violations of the fifth commandment. This is also why Christians treat these issues so seriously is if you get rid of the underlying reason as to why human beings have intrinsic value being made in the image of God, and you redraw that line somewhere else, there really isn't anyone to stop the redrawing of that line again for things like, well, Granny's 97. She can't really do much on her own. She just costs money to maintain her life. So it would be better if she were to die. The reason that we don't make that argument is because granny has intrinsic value just by being alive because she's made in the image of God. So it doesn't matter if her living is now a great inconvenience to me or it costs me money. Okay? But you can see how if that intrinsic value is not there at base level, it becomes disturbingly easy to make those arguments and justifications. Not only that, we have a large swath of human history where the argument that people will make is like, oh, it won't get that bad. That's never actually worked out that way. It always does get that bad, right? That's the same sort of logical rationalization that Hitler makes in order to euthanize the Jews. That he first dehumanizes them and makes them something less. And then that is what allows him to justify the actions that follow. And the same with any other person who's done that in human history. And so we're very adamant about maintaining the intrinsic dignity of the human being being made in the image of God so that we don't go down those dark and terrible roads. Because you pair that with our, our original sin doctrine, that means that if we don't have those, those guidelines and checkpoints and, and laws from God, our own corrupt nature will inevitably lead us to those places that we initially think we would never get to. Yeah, question it. Okay. Yeah. What about a person that's so distraught they're not thinking straight and they commit suicide? So suicide is a tricky issue because I'm not given to know the heart and mind of an individual. Like I've always wondered how many times somebody's committed suicide and they regret it in the midst of it, but can no longer reverse it. Right. So there's there's different degrees there. Um, what this is teaching is that at base level, the taking of your own life is a sin against God because your life doesn't in fact belong to you. So it actually is a murder of self. So usually the idea behind suicide is because of pain and suffering, it would be better if I were dead. And there's usually sort of 
an implicit belief that my life is my own, and so I'm going to choose to end it. Or in Christian teaching, your life isn't, in fact, your own, right? especially now that it's been bought by the blood of Jesus. And that's meant to be an encouraging thing. It's not meant to just be discussed about in this context. It's meant to be that, like, God loved you so much that he bought you at the purchase price of the Son of God's blood. And that now you belong to him. Okay. So um, the official stance on the topic of suicide of the church is that it's a sin. And it's a, it's a touchy one because if your life ends with a sin, it's hard to repent of that sin. And so that's why we really try to teach strongly against that idea and prevent it from happening. Um, it does not mean, like I said, if somebody you know, tries to hang themselves and then when they, when they start it and then they regret it, but they can't, they can no longer do anything about it. Um, I don't know what happens to them, right? If they, obviously if they put their faith in Christ and they repent of what they've done before they die, it's the same as everybody else who's repented of their sins. They're going to heaven, okay? but I can't know that. And I'm just, you know, just thinking that in the case of a person so much in constraint in the mind and they sure. can't figure it or whatever, sure, you, know, you just you can't believe that God would hold that against them and not commit them to go to heaven. So, you know, I just have a hard time with something like that. Sure. So the, 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 the heart of the question you're asking then is, you know, we talk about mental illness and somebody is not so much not in their right mind and they're in so much pain that they make a decision that they otherwise wouldn't make. Is that sort of what you're saying? Yeah, or they could just not be in physical pain, but in their mind, sure. you know, they, they, they just can't get their life straight enough. Sure. Or something like that. Like, yeah. And no, I mean, the, sort of the... The crushing effects of, of having a sinful nature and living in a sinful world and the, all the different manifestations of that coming up in their life. Uh, yeah, and I don't, um, this is where we're getting into an aspect of, of the hidden God. And when you're getting into asking questions about like what's going on inside someone's mind and in their heart. Um, and so what I do in those instances, not just with suicide, but with other issues as well, is I have to trust that God didn't give me that information for a reason. And so I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole of deciding for myself. I just can't see God doing this, or I, I can only see God doing this because then I am ascribing things to him that he hasn't told me himself. And then it may lead me to thinking incorrectly about whatever is causing me to have those thoughts. Right? So I, what I like to maintain is, because I don't know the heart and mind of anyone other than myself, I can't actually ever judge damnation on an individual, right? That's not my job. That's what Jesus is going to do when he comes back, right? But I can, to the best of my ability, share with all of those people what God has said to do and not to do in order that they do not bring harm upon themselves in whichever fashion that manifests. When it gets beyond what the scope of my ability is, then I have to rest in my faith in God and continue to obey him in the ways that he's given me to do so. So in the instance of something like suicide, my job is to continually teach that it's a sin so as not to encourage that behavior or allow someone to think that that is a God-pleasing way to relieve yourself of the sinful world and your own sinful flesh because the scriptures clearly teach that it's not right because your life doesn't belong to you but that doesn't then mean that every time that happens it's exactly the way it's written down because for the things that we've mentioned we just don't know we're not given to know so i know that's not a very satisfying answer but that's just sort of the way it is but it's a great question. It's a great question. I, I think also, Pastor, um, you can also turn to, to other verses. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy on. And we don't know 
if somebody has committed suicide, if God does not have mercy on them. Because quite frankly, what we had said earlier in the conversation was all of us deserve his wrath. Everyone has sinned. Separating one sin from another and saying, well, God's not going to forgive that one. That's not our place. Um, God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy on. And, and we as Christians are to honor that mercy by following his, his, his commands. Um, yeah, I, I would say we, that the question here is not necessarily separating out this as a super special sin. But the question is of repentance or not. So the reason that suicide is treated as such a serious issue is your at, at best your window of repentance of making that decision is very small. And in some cases, it just isn't there. And so that's one of the reasons we treat it so seriously, not because it's a super evil sin that's that's way worse than anything I'm doing, but that like if I sin this week and I come back to church and repent of it, or the next day I repent of it in prayer, then it's forgiven. But if I if it's a sin that that just ends my life, that's the that's the difficult question is is whether or not that person was able to repent of that or not. Because the Bible does teach that the, the unforgivable sin is the rejection of forgiveness, which is in a, in a sense doing something as unrepentant. In other words, making myself God and deciding that this is okay when he says it's not and not seeking his forgiveness for it. I don't know why God lets us do that to the Holy Spirit, but he does. Uh, Allie. So it's that part of it that is difficult for me. Um, what you were just saying and kind of adding on to what he just said, because um, any time when we die from anything, there are going to be things that we do that are wrong. And we can consider some of them worse than others, but I mean, like it just said to be thinking terrible thoughts about someone is the same as murder. So if I'm in the middle of doing that and I'm in a car accident, I didn't repent of those things. Um, so it just seems to me that if, um, you know, where I'm going to go after I die is dependent on, I repented of everything, then that seems to be dependent on my act instead of what Jesus did. So it, it's not a it's not a repentance of every individual thing you're doing. So like Luther's famous for being in private confession for like six and a half hours, um, to the exhaustion of his confessor, right? Because that was the Catholic understanding of repentance was that you did have to do that, right? And then you had to provide some accompanied action that demonstrated that repentance. Um, so you're right in saying that we don't believe that, right? Our our salvation is in the work of Jesus and our faith in that, right? Um, so part and parcel to that faith is living a life of repentance, which isn't in reference to like, okay, I, I, as far as I know, I did 75,000 sins today. So now I have to repent 75,000 times, right? It is a life of repentance. So it's a, it's a like posture of your life that is grounded in faith in Jesus. Um, because you're exactly right. right? That's one of the, the, the very dilemma you're highlighting is why the Catholic Church did last rites if they were able to, so that you could do that. And we will do the same in the sense that, well, I will try and get you communion and I will speak gospel to you constantly when you're on your deathbed, if I'm given that opportunity. Right? So what I want you to hear me saying is not that I'm, whoever you're thinking of, I'm not judging them to damnation. What I'm doing is I'm teaching you what God wants us, the way God wants us to talk about and encourage people in these areas. So it's clear that God wants us to value our life and others' lives. And the reason for that is that they are made in the image of God. And now as a Christian, they belong to a God, having been purchased by the blood of Christ. So at no point in time should I ever encourage suicide as an okay way of dealing with the reality of sin. However, that does not mean that I have the ability or the place to say that everyone who's committed suicide is going to hell. That's a totally different statement and one that I'm never going to be qualified to make. Right? 
So what I, I don't want us to get hung up on that question, right? The question of does this person I know who committed suicide or died living an unrepentant lifestyle go to heaven or hell or not? Because the short answer to that, if you're asking me, is I don't know. Right? What I do know is that Christ died on the cross and he paid for the sins of the world, including the sin that we're talking about. And so I'm going to trust in him. And he's the one who arbitrates that. Right? Um, and I think the uncomfortableness of it is intentional. That's a, I think that's a working of the law. Is that you don't want to ever feel comfortable thinking, well, I can just sort of safely say that anyone who commits suicide is in heaven. Because that sort of tacitly approves of it as a behavior, which God does not want us to do. Does that make sense? Okay. I mean, yeah, like, I'm trying to talk about that in a way that's sensitive because I, I know that many people have known people who've done that or um, are going through similar types of ordeals. <clears throat> so we rely on the compassion of Christ while still, like, trying to lead away from those sorts of things. Does that make sense? Great question. Yeah. It's rewarding when you're with somebody uh, when they go through their justification of very close to death. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's uh, like the <clears throat> the cool thing about our theology with that is like what I would ask you if you were on your deathbed is, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Do you believe that He paid the price for your sins? Yes. There's no thing, behavior or thing that I have to prescribe to you. Yeah, Kristen. Yeah, um, we had a. I have a family member who committed suicide last August 8th. Um, and our family is dealing with this whole subject. Yeah, it's not. not and it's not. troubling. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where we rely on the prayer to God. And we have to be not only in this instance, but really any instance of death, we have to trust in God. Um, because, once again, it's not Adam Thompson who's coming back to judge the world or any of us, right? It's, it's God himself, um, and he has the final say. So we do it. We are always, always trusting in him, which is why in our church we rely on promises like baptism and, and the gospel, right? Um, that these, are, these are signs that God has saved you. Okay. Uh, let's see where are we are. Um, okay, point uh, three there forbids violent behavior and abuse and reckless or self destructive behavior. Um, so, letter C there on the bottom of page 89 it forbids acting violently or abusively toward a child or spouse. Um, so, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Colossians 3 19. And then Colossians 3 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. All right, letter D, it forbids engaging in reckless and self-destructive behavior, for example, substance abuse. So, um, <clears throat> so notice how by Luther's meaning here, he's expanded our fifth commandment. Uh, initially, what we just think is about the act of murder is actually about the act of the way God views life and the way that we ought to view life, our own and others as a result of it. And so things like abuse and not only abuse of others, but abuse of self are seen as violations of this commandment. Because what are you doing when you do these things? You're harming the temple of God. You're harming the temple of God. Why are you doing that? Most people who are committing abuse, either on themselves or others, aren't thinking that they're harming the temple of God. What they've done is they've devalued their own life, or they've devalued the lives of others. Right? Which is why it's related to the fifth commandment. Because the fifth commandment is about life. Yeah? Seeing drug use as a violation of the fifth commandment, don't you think it Kind of 
eating the fire or uh, not exercising or I feel like you asked me this question a lot about a lot of things. It's a good question. I never asked this particular question. Well, just the, the slippery slope argument question. Well, because it happens a lot. I mean, that people saying that this is in the Bible and it's not, I mean, it happens a lot. So, sure. you see, if I um, use drugs in my own home, it doesn't harm anyone else. Um, it may not be a violation of the commandment, but breaking the Ten Commandments somewhere else. Which one? I don't, I just said that. So <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I had no commitment in mind. I'm just thinking if anything that harms our body is breaking the Ten Commandments, yeah. then. Um, What's the slippery slope that you're worried about? That it's going to be equivocated with murder? Um, the slippery slope that I'm worried about is I'm not really worried. I'm just asking you. Well, sure. Yeah. Well, what's the, well, what's the hypothetical slippery slope here? Because I think it's a good question. I'm not. I'm not. Is drug, here it says it, we should avoid and assist our neighbor in avoiding the abuse of drugs and use of any substance that harms the body and mind. So is mine saying that um, I should assist my neighbor by helping him avoid the use of drugs or by avoiding the use of drugs myself, I'm assisting my neighbor? <laughs> if I'm understanding it really, that's what it's saying here. So, I mean, think about like the example you gave would be um, if you have someone in your life you care about, um, like I'm not this the thinnest guy, and I've gained quite a bit of weight since becoming a pastor. So, members of my family will regularly check in on my health, right? Which sometimes I appreciate and sometimes I don't. But I think that they're in keeping with the fifth commandment when they do that. Because the way I'm eating or the way I'm living, in some ways, obviously, is not in line with. And so I'm always in a, in a situation where I'm trying not to do that. Not that I'm ever going to be perfect about it, but like, I think that would apply here. right? So the First Corinthians 6 passage on the top of the next page, top of page 90. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So <clears throat> the reason I was asking what the slippery slope is, is if the slippery slope is you're afraid that it's going to be like treated with the same severity as like murder. I guess the slippery slope is I'm afraid it is used to judge people in a way that is not right because so can you give me an, know, can you give me an example too many things could are used to judge people where they shouldn't be like i could look sure. at someone who is selecting regular coke instead of diet coke and say murderer that breaks the fifth commandment <laughs> well, i don't think that's what the fact that this is part of the fifth commandment is asking you to do right um so notice like the example i gave it wasn't that my my family called me and said, you're murdering your own body, which isn't yours, it's God's. You should stop doing that, you murderer. Like, there are people who've done things like that. That's called legalism. And it's not necessarily applied to any particular law of God. It's a, it's a way of interpreting all of God's laws. And the only way you can really interpret God's laws in a legalistic sense is if you have no grasp of the gospel. And so... If I think that the law is the way that I'm saved, then I would perhaps be justified in approaching people in that fashion. But I don't believe that's the way they're saved, right? So instead, what the law does is it reveals a sin in myself or others. And then every time that Paul talks about like rebuking or correcting, what's the goal? Repentance, Repentance right? To help them. And so in this particular instance, I think the worry that you have is a form of like legalistic worry, which is a real one, right? And I think the way you avoid that isn't by like not having the uncomfortable conversations about, you know, maybe somebody is living in a way that is harming themselves, right? And we want to be able to talk to them about it, not because we want them to feel bad about it, 
but because we want to help them change the way they're doing things, right? Out of concern for them. So it's actually moving us to compassion um, rather than the other way around. But you're right, that is, it is an important thing to be aware of. Um, and they always, they love making movies about Christians like this. And so you have a lot of Christian movie characters who are just sort of like, you don't do this because of this and this, and God will hate you. Okay, that's legalism. Right? Legalism is what led Luther to spend six hours in confession trying to remember every tiny little thing that he did wrong. Right? And, and clearly the gospel's intent is not to spend your entire life repent, actively repenting of every little thing. Right, and, and one of the ways that Luther avoids that entirely is he says, like, there are tons of things that you do that are simple that you're not even aware of. Right, and so, and so that's, how we, that's how we approach these. Is that a good question? Okay, last one here. Um, forbids hatred, despising, or slandering other groups of people. So this one um, automatically, and I think it's specifically called out in here, that means that racism in every form is always a sin. Pre wrongful prejudice is always a sin, right? Um, and it's interesting, there's some weird overlap here with our, our understanding of the individual as an American that's actually good uh, because the, the understanding of the individual as an American was based on these Judeo-Christian values um, that you have intrinsic worth as an individual to God. Okay, That means that these earthly ideas and doctrines about you know because somebody has a certain skin, skin color or because they're from a certain country they're automatically worth less are antithetical to the scriptures and unacceptable and sinful. That one's pretty straightforward, yeah. Yeah. Well, what does it say about the founders of this country that their beliefs were strictly Christian and at the same time they had mass slavery as happening? Oh man, yeah. So we want to get we want to get started with the question was what does it say about the beliefs of the founders of this country that were explicitly Christian, but also endorsed mass slavery. Um, and the, the only thing I can answer there is sinner and saint at the same time, right? So if we start getting into the business of like tallying, well, okay, so here are the things in your life that demonstrates me you're a Christian. Here are the things in your life that demonstrates me that you're not. I don't want to get in that game personally, because I don't think it would go well. Uh, but in the same sense for like throughout history, you have the Crusades and you have all kinds of abuses and violations of the church and our, and our non-believers and opponents of the church, they use those abuses and mistakes right. as a means of justifying their belief that the church is just a human institution and it's terrible and it's not, not really what it claims to be. What is our response to that accusation? Sinful acts of people that believe in God, but they just didn't live it out in their lives the way they're supposed to. Yeah, so we, we talk about we talk about that we're not perfect. And the, the reason we do that is not to sort of give ourselves a cop-out, but we want them to see that, that the Christian faith is actually not about me. It's not about me being perfect. It's not about me being better or worse than you. It's actually about me being horrible and him being amazing. And so I want to talk about him so that you don't get caught up to, you don't let the devil use this idea that, that people are perfect in order to basically dismiss the gospel. Uh, even before the founding of our country, <clears throat> the majority of the founding fathers did not want slavery, but the only way to get the 13 colonies together was to accept it for at least a short amount of time, which is exactly what we did. Uh, that's why the southern states uh, got the three-fifths uh, ruling for the slaves in order because sure. they had you know a vast number of people, but we didn't want them to get that many. Excuse me, the northerners, the, the the people that did not want slaves, did not want them to get that many votes. Uh, so it was we were already in the process of phasing slavery out at the signing of the, the Declaration of Independence. Well, well in I don't want to get too much in the weeds about slavery in the United States because 
slavery does still exist in many places on earth. And if, if you want to evaluate the veracity of any sort of culture prior to like the 17th century, they pretty much all had slavery in some form or another. Um, and the reason that as a Christian, we don't really put our stock in arguments like that is they're not really getting at the heart of the matter, which is that those are all evidence of the world being a sinful place, that Christians are still sinful people even after they've been saved. And so there is no hope in the world. There is no hope in Christians. There's only hope in Christ. Um, so I really like the picture of, uh, in a book that I read that we're beggars pointing other beggars to where they can find the bread, right? Because that keeps you humble. You're not, you're not some rich person in a house that's got everything figured out. You're still a beggar. You just know where to get the bread, right? I think the but, idea of anything is it started right at the, with the disciples when they, when one or two decide who's the greatest. And all it takes is one little thing and I can look at something. I'm just a little bit better than you. Uh, That's the seed that starts. Right, off. right. Yeah, uh, Bob made the point that it started with a small seed, like when the disciples are asking who is the greatest. Um, and then Jesus makes the point that that leadership and authority in his mind is not, uh, which really is the only one that matters, is not lording it over others, but the higher up you are, the more you serve, right? And of course, that's most perfectly demonstrated by Christ himself. Okay. Um, we actually already talked about letter D, but I can bring in some specific resources about, about some of that stuff if you would like um, that, that church historians have written on and things like that. Okay. That should about do it unless anybody has any last questions. You guys had a lot of good questions today. So I'm going to say it's your fault that went a little over time. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. I, I keep forgetting that when I smile and I make a joke, nobody can see it. <laughs> you may not know that it's a joke, but that was a joke. Okay. All right. Um, let's close with a word of prayer as we ask God's blessing as we begin our week. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your word. We thank you that despite our failures and our shortcomings, our hurts and our sufferings, that you sent Jesus, even though we didn't deserve it, to love us so much that he went to the cross, paid the penalty for our sin, and gave us his perfect righteousness so that now we are sons and daughters of the King. We ask that you bless us this week. Give us compassion for our neighbors. Grant us the courage to serve those that you place in our path so that we may shine the light of your love through our actions and our words. All these things, Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Have a great week, everyone. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.